So, good morning to you guys here and online and those who watch later on. And I just want to talk this morning about asking a question, or the title this morning is, When God Doesn't Make Sense. Have you ever been in that point in your life where sometimes God just doesn't make sense? This isn't a, a real great, feel good, high five sermon, but I'm hoping you're going to get some stuff out of it. In fact, some of you may leave this morning kind of frustrated. Some of you may go and, you know, wonder what it was all about. Some of you may leave not feeling any better than what you came. So welcome to church. <laughs> but have you ever felt sometimes that God seems to be uncooperative, sometimes late, and I think probably one of the worst ones is silent. When you feel God's giving you the silent treatment, uh, but God's not like that. But sometimes it does seem that sometimes God is silent. Now, there's always going to be that one person who tends to be the complete opposite. And, you know, they've always got that great testimony, and we've got our own testimonies. But they always seem to be those people who always have the miracle stories. I pray for something that happens the next day. That used to happen when I was a young Christian. It was almost like I pray, it happened, I pray, it happened. But as I, as I grew in God, it kind of developed more into trust me. You see, when the children of Israel went through the wilderness, God provided food and water for them, and he, the clothes, they didn't wear out, and they were celebrating and excited about the miracles of God. But that wasn't God's best for them. God's best for them to go into the land, and in our terms, get a job, plant the fields, reap the field and eat, eat what's of the field. His plan wasn't to continually give them bread, but his plan was that they would plant seed. And as we go in God, it seems sometimes that when once we used to pray that it happened instantly, it kind of takes a bit longer. But often our prayers in the early days tend to be more about us and what we want. But there's always that one person where it seems like no matter what's going on, they're always walking six foot off the floor. And you ask them how they are, and you know, it's, it's the opposite of when you ask somebody and say, how are you, and they drain the life out of you. There's the other people who seem to make you feel so inadequate and small because they're so blessed by God that they are Jesus, Moses, and Elijah all rolled into one. It's kind of like, you know, just God just speaks to them so much and things are going on in their lives. And you just think, okay, if you're that person, we're not worthy, but I'm talking to everybody else, okay, for you online who's maybe sat there going, what the heck are you going on about? But there's a couple of people in the Bible that I want, to, I want to look at their lives who kind of went through a time and these two people are prophets and quite significant ones. Um, the first one's going to be Abraham and he's the first person in the Bible to be called a prophet. Even though you could say Enoch prophesied and we find that in Jude, um, Abraham is actually called a prophet and it's interesting that when God calls him a prophet it's in a time when he's not doing really well with God. So God took him, called him a prophet, and told him to pray for a situation where Abram had got everybody else into. But this is a situation. Abram's having tea with Jesus and two angels. He's having some food. Things are awesome. It's amazing. I mean, imagine Jesus turning up at your house saying, I'm here for tea. And then the angels wander off and he said, well, they're actually off to destroy something. And then Abram suddenly gets into this, this prayer with, with Jesus, this, this struggle with words, and they're talking. And he, and he gets it down, Jesus, if, well, he said, Lord, it's Jesus incarnate pre his birth. But he says this, he said, if there's ten righteous people in Sodom, would he destroy it for, for ten? And, and Jesus says, no, if, there's, if I find ten righteous people, we won't destroy it. So Abraham's on cloud nine, he's, everything's going great. He's been told he's going to have a baby next year. Everything's perfect. And he goes to bed that night and God's, he's been praying and it's great. And he gets up the next morning and he walks out and he looks across and God's destroyed Sodom. What was that prayer about? In Abraham's eyes, he prayed and asked God and he was confident that God wasn't going to destroy Sodom. But the next morning he gets up, God's destroyed it. And he's wondering, what the heck's going on? And in the next chapter, this is chapter, we read the story in chapter 18, 19 and then into 20. In the next chapter, you read that, Abraham goes through this period of time where he's kind of, he, he starts telling everybody this is my sister again. He goes, he kind of, we would term it maybe backside him, but it wasn't where he once was. I mean, at 90, his wife's 89, and a king said, I'll have her. 
She must have been pretty good looking. We need what she had. Never mind creams. We need what she had. And I won't even go into that. Keep that on mind. Move that on. But now Abraham's there. And in this situation, God stopped everybody from having babies. And then Abraham's going to pray for the king. And that's when God calls him a prophet. We know God saved Lot. The thing was, Abraham was praying to God or asking God about save Sodom. But his heart wasn't saying that. His heart was saying save Lot. And God did answer the prayer of Lot, of Abraham, but not in a way that Abraham thought. He thought, if you destroy the city, you'll kill Lot. God thought, I'll get Lot out of there, then I'll destroy it. And in fact, it worked out for God's purposes, but Abraham, it, it took him a while, then he realised what had happened. Interesting Bible study for anybody is, Lot, did Abraham really help Lot in the journey of stuff? Because... He ended up having two, genera- um, two tribes came from Lot, which was always a pain to Israel, but that's another study in itself. So Abraham prayed, and it didn't seem to work out, and it kind of shook him a little bit. And he's the f- father of our faith. Later on, we find out that he was as solid as a rock. And when he got told to sacrifice his son, he was well in there. He's like, come on, let's get this sorted. Reasoning the fact that God could even raise the dead. So he kind of moved on from there. But at this point in his life, Something shook him. So that's the first person, that's a quick one. The next one is another prophet that's mentioned in the Bible. If I was to say to you who was the greatest prophet in the Bible, people have lots of different ideas. But Jesus says John the Baptist was the greatest prophet going. Which is interesting that the first prophet and the greatest prophet neither prophesied nor did miracles. I want to be a prophet. Well, they're the best and the greatest and... You know what I mean? Elijah's not in there, Moses not in there. He says, why were they, the, the, in a sense, the first and the greatest? The greatest being the one, all the prophets in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. He's coming. He's coming. John the Baptist says, he's here. But Jesus also said, if you're least in the kingdom, you're greater than John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist says, he's here and walked away. We say, he's here. In us. So that's why it takes up. So John the Baptist is an interesting character. You know, he was a prophet. He wore animal skins. He ate locusts and honey. He took no rubbish off anybody. He said it as it is. And his job was to prepare the world. And he screamed out, this was the message of, of John as the greatest prophet that ever existed, was repent. That's all he basically said. Turn to God, turn to God, turn to God. Kind of... You know, it wasn't a three-point sermon. It wasn't come back next week and hear a different message. It was full in your face, repent, turn to God. Repent, turn to God. Baptise them, repent, turn to God. And that's all he ever said, basically. And he said this about Jesus. He said, I have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God pointing at Jesus. And amongst the people, John was a complete hero. Amongst the common people. But amongst the other people, they kind of question it. So John's about 31 at this point. He's in full-time ministry. People are coming to see him. Life is great. How better can it get besides eating locusts and honey and wearing sheepskins or rugs or whatever they were wearing at the time. So everything's going right now. I'm going to give you a bit of backstory before we get into the Bible. In amongst all this, John's baptising people and, and telling everybody to repent. Herod, who was a king there, fell in love with his brother's wife, which is not that cool. Let's face it. So, I mean, I'm all right. I'm, you know, I look at my brother's wife and I think, I'm safe. You know what I mean? Not that I'm not watching. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Just get that one back out. It's live. We can't do it. He falls, falls in love with his brother's wife. And then he defo- divorces his own wife and takes her on. Her, Herodias is her name. I hope she's better looking than what her name sounds. And Herodias is there, is there, and John the Baptist goes, it's not lawful. So he gets involved in politics. Starts ranting and raving, repent, be baptised, turn to, turn to, you know, point something at Jesus. Then he goes, king, you're out of order. It's wrong, it's completely wrong. So Herodias hates him and wants to kill him. But it says that Herod actually kind of liked him. Interested, intrigued. 
So John the Baptist then is arrested and put in prison. And in Mark 6, verse 17, that's where we're going to come in. He says, For Herod himself had given orders that John was to be arrested and to be bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying that to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But it's one thing you should never do. Never get a woman who's holding a grudge. Because they can smile and cut you at the same time. <laughs> Straight in there. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But was not able because Herod feared John and protected him knowing he was a righteous man. So now John's in prison and Jesus is outside doing all his stuff. Now you know, John had served God faithfully. He'd done, he was serving, he was doing really well. And he'd announced that Jesus was coming and then he pointed Jesus out and he said to everybody, don't look at me, look at him. Look at him, keep looking at him, keep following him. And he was arrested and he was arrested for what? For doing what was right. Everything was perfect, but now he's in the prison. And it's an interesting one because surely Jesus would have done something to help John. Because they were relatives. I mean, if you're going to do anything. Abraham looked out for Lot. Jesus um, was a relative of John and there was a connection there. And he'd have thought that Jesus would do something. But he didn't do it initially. And it's quite fascinating. So the question I need to ask is, or what I've written down is, did John actually waver a little bit and struggle in his faith? Because since he was in, the mother's, in his mother's womb, the Holy Spirit had come upon him, everything was going right, he was at the peak of everything, now he's in prison wondering what on earth's going on. So he's in prison and Jesus out there, and we jump into Matthew 11 now. <coughs> Matthew 11, it says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds, of the Messiah, he sent his disciples, so obviously some people still around John, he's in prison, being fed, but he was questioning things, he was wondering, what the heck's going on? Because he's in prison, he's a man of God, other than the man who is God, he's the next one there, and things are going great, and now they're not so great, and he's wondering, what on earth's going on? So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So he's doubting it now, He's doubting what he said. He's wondering what's going on. Why? Because his circumstances have changed. It wasn't all high fives and, you know, we're going to take Jerusalem back for Jesus. It was a case of now in prison, wondering what on earth's going on. But to make it worse, is Jesus was doing miracles for people all over the place. And Jesus was doing not just miracles, he was doing turning water into wine. Which to a Baptist, John the Baptist, kind of has caused problems 2,000 years. We don't drink and we're not into that sort of stuff. And so Jesus turns water into wine, but he doesn't go into prison and get, Jesus, uh, get John out. Jump back in. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you have heard and seen. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf ear, and the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed, listen to this. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So not only does Jesus not go to prison and tell John, I am the man and we're doing all right and we'll get you out here on Wednesday. He actually says, don't stumble because of me and you'll be blessed. And he sent the guys back. He didn't even do it himself. Jesus just carried on. So back into a bit of a backstory. So John's in prison waiting. Jesus said, everything's cool, everything's all right. I am the man, you'll be fine sort of thing, and everyone decides to have a party, and it's one in part where everyone brings the ball, and I don't mean slur, this wasn't a Pentecostal party or a Baptist party, this is one where they actually all start getting drunk, so there's a lot of hugging going on, a lot of I love you, you're my best friend, you're my best friend, no you're really my best friend, you know, all that staggering around, having a great time, and Herodias' daughter, Salom, does a dance for him, now, as a pastor, I've got to think this through. I think maybe she did a ballet dance. You know, she's up there with her tutu on and on her toes dancing around. She was probably doing a bit of twerking. 
you know, because of what happens later on, or maybe she even had a pole there, we're not quite sure, but she danced in such a way that she got the drunk's attention to the point where they said, I'll give you anything you want, up to half of my kingdom. Now, what does a teenager want? I know what he's thinking. She even wants a pony, an iPhone, or a couple of tickets for a reunited of One Direction. But it's kind of like going, I've anything, I'm drunk, this is the best time to get some money out of me. And he's staggering around going, she's brilliant, my wife's brilliant, I love you, man. And everybody's great. But this girl goes up to her mum and goes, Mum, what should I ask for? Smart girl. But mum goes, I hate John. So she says to him, go ask stepdad for the head of John the Baptist. So she goes up to him and says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And then, this is what happened. He sends a guard off. Go bring back the egg. And God sent an angel and struck that guard down. Shook that prison and opened the doors. And John came running out. Escaped to the hills, got married. Had two kids. Had a dog. And everything was great. Nah, it kind of didn't happen. Maybe it's like that one where he sends an earthquake and he shakes the prison so much that the entire town's freaking out and John becomes almost a saviour of mankind. But he's a saviour of the town. All the Romans run away. No, that didn't happen either. The earthquake happened for Paul. And the angel happened for Peter when they were in prison. But it didn't. This is what happened. It says the king was greatly distressed because of his oath. And his dinner guest, he'd been showing off and now he had to cash a cheque that he just said. He did not want to refuse her. So he immediately met, sent an executioner with the order to bring John's head back. And the man went and beheaded John in the prison and brought his head back on a platter. Happy ending! John's praying. Lord, my cuz. Stir him up. Let him do some miracles here. Send an angel, send an earthquake. It never happened. Jesus had the power to rescue John, and yet he didn't. Have you ever had a similar situation in your life where you just think, God, you could? And you wonder why? See, our prayers are always answered, but sometimes not in the way that we expect them or would like them to be answered. Not always in the way that we expect. You see, John, John's desire was actually fulfilled. You see, we try to put his situation into our thinking. And we wonder what was really going on. Because John's desire was what was prophesied in Matthew 3.3, 3, which is Isaiah prophesied. It says, this is what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So you've got a prophet prophesying about a prophet to come, which is John. <coughs> And he said, the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight the path for him. Now, did John do that? Yes, he did. Was John's heart, what his desire was, was to prepare the way for Messiah? And he did that. He did his purpose. And when his purpose had come to the end, it was time to go home. Now, getting your head chopped off is a lot better than being eaten by ants, slowly. You, if you want to pick a death, you know, you've got to pick something that's quick, haven't you? And John's in prison, but he gets head chopped off, and everybody's celebrating, but you wonder why. The truth was that John had fulfilled his purpose, and his purpose was to make the way straight for Jesus. And he did that, but more important than what was happening in John's life is that God's purpose was being fulfilled. It happened, but not according to John's plan, but according to God's purpose. You see, the Bible says this in Proverbs 19, 21. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. See, we all have plans and we all have desires and we all have things we want to say and want to do. But it's God's purpose that God's interested in. And God will use whatever he has to use to get his purpose to be fulfilled in anybody's lives. You see, you do not have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. You don't always have to know what's going on to understand and to trust 
in the purpose of God. And sometimes we don't know what's going on. Question, why do, some, why do good people die? Well, actually, to go home. If we save people. But yet we've got this psyche where everyone's got to live to 100 years and everything's going to be perfect and everything's going to be right because we have a westernised mentality of the church where everything's perfect, everything's good. We all get the bigger house and promotion, the better cab. We all have 10 kids and we all live till they're 99 as well. And everything's perfect and we always go on holiday three times a year and everything's wonderful. And the music's never wrong and it's always the right song, never too quiet, never too loud. The communion's always perfect and we have a great time. But life's not like that. And most of the world is not seeing church like that. You know, you pray for somebody, for somebody and, and then they go and die. And you're thinking, what is God doing in, in all this? I remember a story by John Glass, and I don't often like to refer to second-hand stories, but he tells a story of a, a baby that was born in the church in, in, in one of the churches in Scotland that he was pastoring. And um, the baby's young and then suddenly got taken ill. And he, he, he was dying once as a child, and everyone's praying and praying and praying. And John went to God after a, a, a while and said, Do you not care, God? And God said, Yes, I do. And he said, Why don't you heal him? And he said, I will, but you will live to regret it. And everybody celebrates, and a miracle happened in the church, and everybody's brilliant, and it's great, and everyone, woo, woo. This is me. Nobody got saved through that miracle, which is interesting, and it kind of faded out into history. But John sat in his office one day when the mother of that child, now always 18, 19, came into her office and he's trying to talk to her and she said this, I wish he'd have died when he was one because he'd become a drug dealer, a drug addict and he got into some awful stuff and God spoke to him then he's, and he, he regretted it. So sometimes we don't always know the why but we can trust the purpose and we don't always know why things happen in our lives but we can trust the purpose. You see, you, pray, you, you work hard, you're a diligent worker, but you end up losing your job and you think, why, what's going on? And you don't always get the better job in those. I believe that we do go on to better jobs, but sometimes you don't always get the better job. Life's not always like that. Some people suffer from depression all their lives, yet they're strong in their face. Some people struggle with illnesses or migraines and stuff like that, come and go. And yet there's an easy answer, but there's the answer of reality is that they can sometimes all you can do is trust in God. And they've been there where you, all you can do is just trust in God. You see, over the years, I've seen most of my own hopes and dreams crash and burn. You know, from a young child, I had some amazing dreams, some amazing things I wanted to see and hopes there. And they crashed and they burnt. And I've, you know, I wonder sometimes, God, what are you doing? And God's looking at me going, well, what are you doing? And all I'm going is going, well, all I can do is trust you. And I don't have that many left. You know, sometimes God's got to take you to a point where you just get to the point where all you can do is trust him. When all your dreams have just collapsed around you and you think, well, where are you in this God? God's going, now it's time to trust me. You see, John was only in his early 30s when he was beheaded. But, you know, I don't put my faith in my plan. I put my faith in God's purpose for my life. And I know God's not finished with me and I know God's not finished with you. And if God's not finished with you, it means he's got a purpose for you. But his purpose may not be the great singing and dancing thing that we often read about or want. Sometimes we look at people who are on Christian TV and think, wow, I want their light. And we don't understand what they've gone through to get where they're going. Most people don't appreciate that Smith Wigglesworth, who operated in some amazing things, only operated those things in the last part of his life. We always think he was born that way. No, he wasn't. He developed. You see, if you've got hopes and plans, that's great, go for them and, and go after them. But sometimes they may not happen the way you think they're going to happen. It may not be what you think it's going to be. Because God's plan and purpose is more important than our situation, than our, our personal needs. Now you are important to God, but God's got bigger things that he's looking at. You see, two years or so after John the Baptist died, Jesus was in a garden. And he was asking this, but he was actually praying this, God, not my way, but your way. Not my will, but your will be done. See, Jesus had got to that point where he didn't want to go to the cross, but he was prepared to go to the cross. And Jesus was only 33 when this was going on, so he'd not lived a great life, as in a great long life. He'd had trouble, a lot of trouble, to press, and now he's heading towards the cross. And Jesus was in the garden and said, not your will, but mine. In other words, he was saying, not my plan, but your purpose be done. 
See, Jesus could have stood up there, called his angels, saw, saw the Romans out and sat on the throne going, here I am. But we wouldn't have been entered into that. We wouldn't have been part of that. You see, he had a bigger plan, a bigger purpose. And then on the cross, after agonising in the, in the garden, now he's been beaten and he's whipped, he's been stripped, he's been staked and, and pinned to this cross. And on the cross, he's looking up and he's always had God the Father there, really near him, constantly. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, why have you turned your back? But it's only when we look backwards to these stories that we can understand the why. You see, John the Baptist had a purpose to, to make this plan, to make the way straight. But Abraham couldn't understand why God had killed, uh, destroyed Sodom until we look back and go, we understand why he destroyed Sodom, but he did say a lot. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason why God turned his back on, because if he looked at his son, he could have wiped everybody else out there. I'm not being funny, but some of you, if somebody said something wrong to your child, a little monster rises up in you, and you'll become somebody completely different. And for other people, it might be your pet. It might be somebody else. It might be somebody cutting you off as you're driving down the road, but something rises up in you. Imagine God Almighty, who could wipe out generations, who actually did say to Moses, step aside, mate, I'm going to kill everybody here. And Moses stood there and said, no, let's not do that, God. And Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine if God had turned around and looked at him, he could have blasted all Israel and all them people off the planet, which wouldn't have been good for us. Because if they'd have done that, there'd have been no path of salvation for us. So when you look back, you think, well, God never answered that question. God was silent in that cry of Jesus, his only son. The reason why he was silent is for you and for me. Looking back. So even in our own lives, we can sometimes look back and go, God, I've been praying about this, but it's only years later. You look back and go, now I see what you are doing. Now I understand what you're doing. You see, in the moment, it may not be brilliant and roses in the garden. It may be ducks running across your lawn. It's that bad. But the case is, it's only when you look back and you go, now I understand. Sometimes we need to look back as testimony to what God's doing. You see, we are important to God and our problems are important to us. But God's purpose is what's important to him. You see, we've got this cycle where God's got to bless us, God, and God does bless us. God's amazing that he blesses us so much. But do you know what's the most important thing to God is somebody going to heaven or hell? He's not interested in our gifts that we want and how we shine and how we preach outright. He's interested in his purpose being fulfilled in our lives so it gets people saved. Because when somebody dies and doesn't know Jesus, they're going straight to hell. There's no comeback from that. And when a Christian dies, they go straight to heaven. And yet often the Christians are mourning like they've gone to hell. And yet we're going to see him again. Sad as it is, we're going to see him again. But Jesus is concerned about the person that's near the end of their life. And we're more concerned whether we've got... Put that out of my mind. Whether or not we're blessed or not. See, Peter says this. The Lord is, is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. That's why sometimes he's silent. He's patient with us. Not wanting anyone to perish... But everyone to come to repentance. God's purpose, Jesus' purpose to come to this earth wasn't just to get us blessed. It was to bring mankind back to God and give them an opportunity. It wasn't so we could have a big car and a big house and a great holiday as much as you can have those things. It was to bring mankind back to the reality that they need Jesus. That's it. That's God's purpose. So John the Baptist wasn't forsaken by Jesus. He had a purpose and there were a plan. And he fulfilled it and it was amazing. I bet John's having a great time. Woohoo! This is good. Chop my head off again quicker next time. Let's get up there. I do know this from what I've read and what I've heard is I've never heard a believer get raised from the dead who said thank you. But I've heard many unbelievers get raised from the dead who did say thank you. Because nobody who stands in the presence of God and then comes back down to this pit would be thankful. I mean, imagine dying and you're standing there in front of Jesus and you look into his eyes, it's like totally amazing. I'm here and I've arrived. The whole world and everything behind is just fading out. 
like a dream that you just woke up and then somebody in the name of Jesus <laughs> raised them back up and they've been dragged away from God <laughs> back into the body. Whatever you're doing. But we're sad. We need you. Let me go. That's Smith Wigglesworth's wife, you know. What have you done, Smith? <laughs> They'll slap them back. But sometimes we don't have to understand the plan. But we can trust God's purpose. Why am I like this, God? Why am I like this? Well, read some of the stories in the Old Testament and you'll understand that they all had issues and problems. And yet God still fulfilled his purpose. You know, sometimes God may be silent. It may seem distant. But he's nev never absent from your life. He's always there. I wrote this down, uh, and I did put part of it on Facebook. It said, maybe the one thing that you're asking God to get you out of is the very thing that Jesus is asking to join you in so that you can see and understand his purpose. See, sometimes we want God to get us out of a situation that we got ourselves in like idiots. But Jesus says, yeah, I can get you out. But can I come and sit in there? When Ethan were young, um, I think before we even came to this church, he ended up having a night in hospital. And he were laid in the cot thing that they got there for him. And quite interesting. And I'm, I'm there with him. And there were no beds left, so I had to sleep on the floor or in the chair. And he's laid there, and, and I'm with him. I wouldn't want anybody to go through that sort of thing as a parent, but I had a great time with him that I wouldn't have had if I wouldn't have been in that situation. Not that I'm saying that situation is a great situation to be in, but sometimes it's only after you've been through the situations, even though you walk through the valley of a shadow of death, that you appreciate the awesomeness of God while you're walking through it. You have to camp, you've got to throw, go through it. So I'm gonna um, bring this to an end. So I'm gonna say goodbye to you guys on there. And I hope that uh, you've enjoyed that. So I'll see you next time. This is a couple of verses I just want to read to you. I used Abraham, first prophet, and John the Baptist, the, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And, um, you know, John was called the greatest. Abraham was the first. And both of them struggled at times. But they caught through it. And they carried on. And you could say, well, John didn't get through it. Yeah, he did. He's through it. And sometimes they all got to go through it. In Hebrews 11, we'll read this, first one. And we're coming around the communion table now. So we're just keep an eye on, on things and listen to what we're saying. It says, now faith has been sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. For this is what the ancients were commended for. I mean, it lists loads of people. People you can read throughout the Old Testament. And then we get to this. That these all were commended for their faith. Uh, yet none of them received what was promised. They were all commended for their faith. But they didn't receive what was promised. What, what we're talking about in the promise is the promise of, of, of Jesus. The promise of eternal life in the sense of what we've got. And he says this, God had planned something far better for us. I like that. It doesn't mean we're exempt from the struggles of life. But what he's talking about is we've got the Holy Spirit living inside us. That will continue with us. God has planned something far better for us so that only together with us, that's the Old Testament guys, with us, this is now the body of Christ, they will be made perfect. Therefore, or because of everything they just read, that's read it yourself, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's all those people gone before, the good, the bad and the ugly ones, they're all there, let's throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with perseverance of race marked out before us. Whatever's happening, you keep on moving forward. Whatever's going on, you keep moving forward into things that God's got for you. Who knows? Where are you going to be next week, next month, next year? Who are you going to encounter? The difference is, whatever you focus on your own issues and your own problems, you're not impacting somebody else's life, at least not positively. 
And then he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, so he's now given an example, of the, set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, that's Jesus, who endured such opposition from a sinful man, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. See, Jesus says, blessed anyone who doesn't fall away because of me. And what he's saying here is, you know, um, he endured so that we do not grow weary and lose heart. Because it's in weariness that sometimes you can lose heart. But you've just got to keep going. You don't always have to understand the plan. You've just got to understand the purpose. You don't have to know why and how it's all working. Just understand God's going to work it out. In fact, it said in Romans 8, 28. I'm lucky because some of you guys are already ahead of me on that one, aren't you? But I'll read it to you. To make sure I get it right. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So if you're saved, you love him. Who are called according to his purpose. So whatever God's purpose and he will turn around in your life. Anything that happens to you and anything that happens to me for, the good, for our good. And you think sometimes, well, they died. Well, to them, that was pretty good. In the big scheme of things. But maybe not for us. So whatever's happening, it's a case that God will always work out for the good of those who, are, who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For God, who we foreknew, he predestined to conform to the likeness of his son. See, sometimes you just got to keep on focus forward. Keep thinking, keep moving. And just sometimes trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, your own plan. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. John the Baptist made Jesus' path straight. And Jesus will make our past faith to fulfill his purpose in our lives. I told you it wasn't a great high five one. And so he's like going, God, I come to church. But we're going to come around communion table because you all know what this stands for. You all know what it means.